podcasting with Kerry Jones. Hey guys, and welcome to this week's podcast. Well, it's been three years this Friday I put my first podcast up. I can't believe where all the time's gone. And since that time, I've had over 140 episodes, plus 120 plus guests. And what a journey it's been for me. I thought I needed to do something different. As then a good friend of mine, Carol, suggested about doing a podcast. And to be honest, I'd heard of a podcast, but I didn't know anything about them then. So I've got to thank Carol for that. And she's the actual voice at the start of every episode. So because it was all new to me, it was a learning curve. And I bought all the gear, the recording equipment, the mics. I set up a little corner of the studio at home and practiced. I think it must have been around April, May time. When it comes July, I put one up quite nerve-wracking because when you start something new you're thinking is anybody going to take an interest it amazed me the response i had and in the first couple of months it just rocketed up to about four thousand listeners and i think it was the right time for me to set it up as well because it was locked down it was important for a lot of people every friday my podcast would go up speaking to different guests and i used to get such a buzz after every episode would go up the number of messages I would get throughout the weekend then regarding the podcast, whether or not they, they've been to this water or they know the person or, and more importantly, how much it was helping them through through this uh, lockdown situation. So as time went on, I realised I was onto something good. And since then, I've made a lot of new friends from UK and Ireland. And I want to thank all that we took part who joined me as a guest on my podcast. And as things were growing week by week, I was spending more and more time doing the podcast and the photography started to slip because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. It takes two days a week in producing the podcast, the planning, the preparation, recording and editing of the production. So to keep this going, I started a Patreon channel in December 21 to help bring some money in to keep the podcast going. I was just doing two free podcasts now, but as the Patreons who joined my channel, the two extra in effect still having one every week so a huge huge thank you to my patrons because without you it wouldn't still be going and i still appreciate all the message every weekend i get and those of you who are not my patrons please consider joining my channel because you will get weekly podcasts and access to over all the archived episodes going back to the start over 140 episodes plus behind the scenes photographs which go behind these podcasts showing venues, action, fish pictures, and fly patterns which some of the guests talk about. And occasionally, I get a selection of prizes to run competitions. So for this episode, instead of having a guest, I want to put together just a small selection of some of the finest moments in the last three years of my podcasts. It was quite hard to choose which ones, i got to say, with over 125 guests and a lot of poignant and uh, funny stories. It was so hard. So we hope you'll enjoy this election. Sit back and relax and listen to my three-year anniversary episode. Episode 123, John Graham. I don't know what the drug is like, but I can tell you this. It can't be any worse than c <laughs> Absolutely immense. The fishing that I've had, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Yeah. I'm telling you now, nobody would. Nobody, nobody was moving around a there at that time like me. I knew every twig, every branch, because I lived there. I lived and breathed it. If somebody had been there and moved a twig, I wing without the, I, no torch, no torch. Pah! 
in them days you didn't you, you well I was so familiar with the, with everything do you understand I was blended in <laughs> yeah. oh, second Carrie, I wish you could have seen it yeah. I wish you could if, do you know if the boys in Wales knew what sea trout fishing was really like they would be screaming for it. Yeah. There's no other branch of the sport that comes anywhere close to it. Everything else is tame compared to sea trout. Night fishing I'm talking about now, not fiddling about in the day. Yeah. Fiddling. What do you say now, you're on... <laughs> Episode 7, David Miller. I know the, the Tyree very, very well for the... Again, from a diver's perspective, no, not not an angler's perspective. I've met some incredible um, sea trout and salmon in in, oh, my, in my time in the Tawi and and the Gwili and the uh, and the Cothy and the Souther. So it won't be surprising one day if I'm fishing for sea trout one night and I see a snorkel <laughs> coming up into the pool. <laughs> I do, I do, for obvious reasons, avoid going at night. De- definitely, I, I, I have upset over the years. I'm literally just one or two fishermen when they've turned up. The fisher pool, and they've seen me sort of um, coming out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In one in one pool on on the coffee. Um, what I what I do to relax um, after a dive sometimes, like you're chasing, um, you know, shadows. Really, the fish are here, and then they're gone, and it's hard work. You are swimming up river. So we've I've had a session photographing, um, and also just because it's what I, what I love to do late in the season, one year on the coffee. It was a deep pool about 10 feet deep and I had a good dive seen some fish so I lay on my bike on the bottom of the pool just you can just lie as, as a with your scuba gear on and then just Looking watch up. watch the surface and watch the leaves coming down wow. and it, it is it is like wow this is amazing so but some guy I couldn't see him had arrived to fish the pool <laughs> <laughs> And he sees me and he thinks I'm stuck. And he said, because I don't know how many minutes I, w- I was lying there, not not moving. And the coffee, especially when I dive, I choose it when it's really clear. And I don't know whether you know the coffee, it can be incredibly clear. So he could see virtually every every detail on me lie, lying on the bike, non moving. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when I, you know, finally decided, he said I was just about to uh, phone the emergency services. <laughs> so... Thankfully, he he didn't. But um, no, I've, I've had I've had some incredible days. Again, etched in my memory forever on on the coffee. Just just episode one hundred and twenty one. Peter Boyle. There, there was a storm one day, and the storm had blown a tree down across the river. You know, and this was great. We were but we were fourteen, fourteen at the time. I just turned fourteen. <laughs> and uh, I said, Jesus, Packy, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make a hook, you know, and the hook right beside the river. Fantastic. This is going to be our fishing lodge, you know. So uh, we decided then we needed a pool table. So um, I, you know yourself over here in Ireland that you have the, over here in Ireland, you have the kind of undertaker slash pubs, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. a pub generally serves as an undertaker's too. I'll tell you what I've seen that. And I'm not sure what England is like, but definitely over here yeah. or Wales is like it's important. So uh, we decided, right, they were renovating up the local pub in the village that I was from, you know. So I says to Packy, I said, do you know what we'll do? We'll go and we'll take the pool table, you know. Not a word about actually buying it or borrowing it, but we're actually going to steal the pool table. So <laughs> three of us had it up the road and uh, we got into the pub. The pub was open because they're renovating it. And, but so nobody told us the pool table had a slate top on it. It's heavy, isn't it? And I oh, said, listen, the two of us half with standing at the corner of the pool table trying to lift it and oh, could no more lift it than the man in the moon, you know. So next thing we are looking around in the same room and here there's these couple of coffins all hanging up <laughs> around the, the wall, around the walls of the, 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 the room, you know. So I says, Paddy, I says, Jesus, there's one with a lid on it. And here us, here we get trying to screw this lid off. <laughs> some poor old get lying, some poor get lying in the coffin, you know. Past no mark, so we couldn't get the lid off anyway. So we decided, Jesus, wouldn't it be a great idea if we were to lift the coffin and use the coffin as a raft and we'd float it down the river down to the hut, you know, because the village was actually built on top of the river almost, you know. Yeah. So this idea was seconded anyway and approved. So the two of us got each end of a coffin. Uh, we carried it down the stairs and we were crossing the main road with it. And as we were crossing the main road, the RUC landed in the paddy wagon and here was these two lads walking with this coffin across the road. 
So of course they stopped, <laughs> put us into the back of the paddy wagon, left the coffin on the side of the road and brought us up to the barracks. So he says, the policeman says to me, he says, uh, who will I notify? He says, is there anybody you want to ring? And I says, well, gee, I don't want to ring but my mother, you know. <laughs> I had to ring my mother and I said, Mom, I'm in trouble. I was arrested <laughs> by the police for stealing a coffin out of the pub. So, of course, like any Irish mother, first things first, she got on the backbone to the local priest and the local priest landed up to the barracks. And God love him, he's since deceased. But he turned around to the police and he told the police that he had asked us to move the coffin for him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! So I tell you, I may ask a queer, got a queer, got a queer timber, and when I got home, by I tell you, it was raw for days after. Jeez. But it was, it, was, it, it was the talk of it was the talk of the county. This coffin left beside the road, and nobody in it, and no lid on it. And <laughs> Episode forty-six, Paul Slaney. We, we went. Uh, I went on a bone fishing trip, and my wife came with me. One and only time she ever come fishing with me, and. Um, Anyway, we'd done some bone fishing, and it was the end of the day, and we were just messing about, so we thought we'd, we'd try some sharks, you know, shark fishing. So we caught a barracuda, uh, and cut it up to chum the sharks in, That's which we did. Um, so now we're on a 19-foot skiff, there's me, my wife, and uh, the guide, uh, Colin, a uh, little guy, he's only about, you know, he was less than five foot tall, stocky, powerful boy, but, you know, he wasn't the biggest lad you've ever met. So by now, the 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 boat is surrounded by sharks, so they're like white tips, not huge, but big enough, you know. Um, and the, and the, the 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 way of fishing for him was to tenno hook on a heavy spinning rod with a chunk of barracuda on it, and literally take the bail arm off, choose which shark you wanted to catch, really, and throw, you know, the lump of bait at it like a cricket ball. And then put the bail arm on and hope he took it. Which oh, you literally throw one cast. Throw literally, it. literally, you couldn't because it was such a big lump of stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, just throw it at it. Anyway, so I didn't miss this. This shark just turned and took it. <laughs> <laughs> Tightened onto it and, you know, got got this shark on the end and the rod's bending. And I was stood on the casting deck of a bonefish skiff. And I took one step backwards to, to tighten into the fish and there was no deck left. I just went straight in the water. Jeez, that would have been a great video clip. Oh, it? Christ, man. I, and I can remember going... <laughs> I can remember going in, and bear in mind, this boat, this little boat is literally surrounded by him, and it was shallow. I, I felt my feet hit the, you know, the, 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 the bottom, so it was, it was maybe a little bit deeper than me. I remember thinking, this is it. And uh, I pushed back up, and as I pushed back up, my head came out of the water. Colin was there, grabbed me by the shoulders, and literally manhandled me back on the boat. I swear, I swear my fags were still dry. I was in and out so fast. <laughs> you know? and my wife was like, ah. you know, it was one of them. Time to go home, sort of thing. Episode 12, Dennis Esplister. In Alaska, we, that's part of the deal. We fly into a remote area, get dropped off by the float plane. He says, he makes a loop over it in the air and says, you need to walk along here and drop off into this hole, and that's the river, and I'll pick you up in 10 hours. Okay. Wow. So we got bear spray on us, and, you know, I don't have a gun, but I should. And, yeah, we got charged this it was like a you know like a teenager bear male bear uh charging us and he got to about 10 feet 12 feet charging coming at us and i sprayed the bear spray and what <laughs> happened was uh i got drew in the face and myself in the face and you know I the, missed bear the bear stop yeah i missed the bear <laughs> and I, it's a, it's a pretty funny story hindsight, but yeah, it's a fog. If you've ever sprayed bear spray, which most people haven't, oh. uh, it's a fog. And I mean, I would, if I was going to make bear spray, it'd be like wasp spray. It would spray 20 or 30 feet out there in a stream, you know, like a <laughs> rocket. This shit, shit was a fog. I was like, what is this crap? You know, just this big fog came back in our faces and we were oh, spraying God. it. Oh, it was, was it a black bear? Painful. Was it? No, it was a grizzly, yeah. A all grizzly? grizzly bears, wow. Know? And it was scary at the time. Funny story, hindsight. You know, we were full of bear spray and coughing and dying. And... Episode 63, Emir Lewis. The trip we'd done on the boats down from Big Swear down to Tintin. And we'd come out in Tintin, and it was only about two or top of two at the bloody mud bank. I can see it. 
dragging the dinghy up this bloody mud bank where the tides have been. The huge tide drop on about Inton. And we've come out and uh, our driver called the driver to come in. He was not far away. He brought, brought, came in the car and I said, listen, we've got a trip. I, I fancy going up to Bycross, I said. Uh, a big pool above Hereford. And we'll have a look at that as it's getting light in the morning. And my mate, Hugh, from Bridgen, said, oh, good idea, good idea. We'll go up there. So up we went, the four of us. And when we got to Bycross, Bycross was a big pool. I would like to say 400 yards long, at least, huge pool yeah. above Hereford. And we'd gone on the back road side of it. And we parked our car now, and it was about, I don't know, half past four. Yeah, around that time. Yeah. We walked to the pool, but the mist was all over the pool. Couldn't see a thing. Thick, thick mist. And two of, the, of, our, of our, our lads, two of them had gone to the top of the lake. And me and old Hukin had gone to the bottom of the lake. And when we got and, and Hukin said, oh, waste of time. He said, it's too thick mist. Anyway, I said to Hugh, listen, I said, I can see some peg there. I need to check it, if it's an old net peg or what. You, you walk back, I said, and I'll catch up with you. Anyway, I don't know, it's like the heaven opened. I went, walked to the, the peg, and suddenly the mist rose like that. Yeah. And all I could see was all these men on dinghies, pulling nets out of the, of the, of the pool. And I could see these big salmon, 20 pounders in the nets, pulling into the boats. Jesus Christ, I fell on my, on my face. <laughs> and I can't, I can't see me now pulling myself along with the grass, trying to pull myself up out of the, out to, to hide. And luckily, like, my hue turned around and saw me. And I made signs on him that something was happening. Anyway, I got to Hugh and I, I, we called the other two guys on the radio and said, you know, we met up and, and had the chat. And I said, listen, I said, um, we'll watch what's happening. And we watched and we could see all these, four of them carrying all this gear, uh, nets and bags of fish and everything to a gateway further up the road where, than we were. And they were waiting by this gateway then at the end. I said, listen, the best thing we can do, I said, is to drive in our car to the gate, stop right by the gate, jump out and catch them there and then. You know, we can have them. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, 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 okay. I said, well, right. I said to the driver, I said, um, make sure you stop at the gate. Don't. So you were expecting them to come at a certain time? Oh, yes, or always. They were working to, always work to an hour. I, I, I said, I bet you they're going to get picked up at six. And they would be there at six. And, uh, and anyway, we went now, ready to go. And the, the bloody driver in our car passed the gate. I won't tell you what I called him. He passed the <laughs> gate, but about 30, 40 years. I said, get back, back. back. And I... And, I said, he stopped by the gate, and by the time we got to the gate, this field was a big cornfield. And these chaps were starting to run down through the cornfield. I could see them popping up like this. So we let the dogs go now uh, on these four chaps running, and uh, we caught the first two, and, uh, and, and then released them, and got them cuffed up, and then released the dogs again. I caught one more. Episode 24, Stephen Gale. Friends then who were fishing Corrib. Oh, yeah. The, Brian the, oh, the, and the, uh, cracking Colin boys. Higgins. Cracking boys. Yeah. As you say, I can remember I the went highest. out in a boat with them, didn't I? Remember? They, they were they were dapping and I was on the point and I, and I was uh, fishing traditional flies, obviously. Yeah. And uh, we all had, we had a few fish and then we pulled on that, like what you to do, we pulled on the island, lit the fire, cocked them, ate them, oh, I was, it was, but they're so laid back, so laid Brilliant, back in Ireland. Uh, as you say, I can remember, they were staying in the caravan, weren't they? The, the, yeah. They had, and we go, it's 10 o'clock, well, where are they? Where are they? We go, well, they all stood in bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just all, just, and do you remember? Because they had their own boat, and there was a slipway, and they had a <laughs> highest van. I think one of the boys then he had the highest van with a with the boat trailer, and you reverse into the slipway, 
stepped out. Column then was rowing the boat to put onto on the, the trailer. trailer to take the boat out. And when the boat got on the trailer, it was obviously more weight. And there wasn't enough tension on the handbrake and the whole boat, the trailer, and half the van just sunk <laughs> into the... <laughs> And then everyone was flapping around. The van, the van, the 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 fucking van. van. (laughs) And then you, everyone's just watching. And then I I darted over to look for the handbrake. And I couldn't find it. And then I seen you just dive in through the window of the passenger. (laughs) The handbrake was on the dash. You you had to pull the handbrake from the dash. And we stopped it from going totally submerged. Totally submerged. It was still all right. It worked after. I know. That's Toyota. Highest we were. I don't see. Bulletproof. And I had my XR4i then, and oh, I God, told I told the van out then. Luckily, I had a, a tow bar in it as well. Like biggest fright they ever had with that XR4i, <laughs> oh, and it wasn't the one where, where you were racing back from uh, Blackdown or Chew or wherever we'd been. It was when your father was driving it from North <laughs> Wales. <laughs> Do you remember? And we come under the bridge. <laughs> And we, I don't know, we both woke up because we were both sleeping. Your father was driving, and we went, Stop! Because he was heading straight for the roundabout. He must have been doing about 90 miles an hour. Was it? I don't remember that. You must remember it, Kerry. Uh, I think with, with shocks like that, you put it, put it in the back. In back. <laughs> Episode 119, Neil O'Shea. Yeah, you, you were telling me there was a, a method you use which is quite unique um, when you first. It's very unique, yeah. You'd row the boat over, back and forth over the line. and you'd fish it with a double-handed rod, it's, you, and it's 90% uh, with a floating line here. So, you know, it makes it very easy. You use two flies, and uh, you cast uh, 20, 25 yards, and you retrieve it back nice and steadily, and the boat is held in position. She's not dropped down on where the fish are lying. So you'd be looking for certain marks on the lake? They'd be kind of... The standard marks like that, they are, you know, like that. They're at the points of islands where the river flows into the lake and certain uh, ledges on the water, ledges where the fish would rest around, around them, you know, not in deep water. It's not, and as early in the springtime here, there is probably five or six lies that are worth fishing and boats take their turn at it and things like that. You know, you'll row the boat, the water rock, or you would have a, a flow of wind taking in the wind direction, taking it across the point of an island, and the fish will lie in these areas and will fish them back and forth. They will fish them for maybe half an hour, forty-five minutes. You'll give it a rest for twenty minutes, half an hour, and you'll try it again. Or you'll wait and you'll see a fish jump and you'll try it. Then that's the way it works. It's kind of, I think, the only other place I do it is in the Hebrides, like this, like that. You live right near the lake, don't you? More or less on the shore. I'm about, as the, as the crow flies, I'm about, what would I say, 600 yards, 1,000 yards from the lake, and I, I'm, a, I'm a quarter of a mile by the road. Because I remember yeah. I fished it a few times, and I've gone out from your harbour. That's in my brother's, um, that's in my brother's land, and we have the, we developed the ha- harbour, well, there was a kind of an arm of a natural harbour there, but we kind of developed it a bit back in the 80s, and made it safer for the boats to be more there and all that, like, so. Yeah. We have, uh, have you always lived there? I only moved about a quarter of a mile. And that's where you are now? Oh, the only re- the, the only, yes, well, I'm sitting here you now looking out in the lake. It's a bit dark now at the moment, but uh, the only reason I moved is I have a better view from where I am now than where I was before. <laughs> Episode 101, Will Millard. It's a bit of a funny moment the night before. So that night, Ken brews all his own booze. You know, and he drinks a lot and expects you to drink a lot whilst you're there. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to record this piece with him about about his wines and his brew. And I'd, I'd written this whole piece about birch sap wine, which is one of his favourites. Oh, and I mentioned yeah. I'd never tried it. And his, and his eyes lit up and he was like, birch sap wine, I beautiful nectar from heaven. Jumps over to his huge booze collection and picks up this bottle off the ground. Hands it over to me and I had to use a pair of pliers, carry to get the get the cork out of this bottle. <laughs> Never. I was looking at it, I was like, oh, it looks weird. It was kind of like orange and kind of glowing a little bit. It wasn't what I'd sort of seen birch that looked like, but I put some in my glass and 
tried it and immediately like my throat was just on fire. I was like, oh, this tastes rough, man. It didn't, you know, it didn't taste, it tastes fruity, but not how I'd imagine birch sap to be. But I was like, oh, this must be just what it is, you know? Yeah. And then he said, oh, come on, give me a swig. And he took a swig and he went, Bleh! He's like, what the hell is this? He's like, my throat's on fire. And obviously, I was then like, oh my God, what has he done? And he looks at the bottom and he suddenly, his whole face is just contorted with fear. And he, and he turns to me and he said, this bottle, this bottle was dropped off by some lone hiker that came through and he just left it here. I never, ever meant to drink this. And he said, look at it. And, and then we looked at it under the light of the fire because he's got no electricity. It had all these like blobs floating in it. It looked absolutely disgusting. Oh, and then no, that was it. No. He, he was like, Will, we're going to die. We're going to die. He's poisoned us. <laughs> it's probably got anthrax in it. And then he started telling me, he was like, you know, serum from foxgloves, you can put that in drink and it disguises it completely. We'll have organ failure in two days. I was like, <laughs> oh, Ken, <come> man. <laughs> Episode 91, Terry Bromwell. And, uh, I said to Bush, you watch now, I said. You watch me hook something, to, I like a big monster or something tomorrow, I said. Yeah. And he said to me, you don't want to hook big fish. I said, I know I don't want to hook big fish, but it'll happen. You watch. It and it bloody happened. I saw the picture of you holding a fish with the bridge behind on Facebook. And I didn't know which was bigger. The fish or you were smiling? Oh, my smile. It oh, was I was, like, I was, was more of a laugh than a smile. It was a laugh. It was like a, a disbelief, <laughs> like what the hell, like. And it and, and I say, yeah. I think every picture I got is me, like just like grinning, like a chest of cat, because I was like, yeah. I was like, and it was a nice fish as well. Sometimes you get big fish, which they may be lean, yeah, or they're ugly looking fish. But that but was like this prime. thing was, and it was, and it was an end as well. Yeah. And I, I was like, I watched that fish go away, and I thought, that's that's something I'll probably I'll cherish yeah. for the rest of my life. <laughs> Before I caught that fish, I was, I, before any international or any competition, as my time comes down to 10 minutes before I start, I'll go to the riverbank, I'll get on my knees, and I'll always rub my hands in the mud or the silt that's in the river. I always do it. I've done it for, since I've ever international fish. I rub my hands in the, in the silt, and I'll wash my hands off, I know it sounds bonkers, but it's just my little thing. We all got our own little things, don't we? Yeah. And um, I, that day, I said, I said to the fish gods, I, I said, just show me your secrets, and I'll take the most at, at most respect for what you show me. And and, and this is this is God's honest truth. For my children's like this is what I said, and that happened. Episode eighty-three, Jerry Murphy. Father was working. There was a boat. There was a boat on a trailer here, uh, probably to go to the lake when my father came from work or something. We, I remember I was only probably twelve, fourteen. But uh, I'm the eldest in the family. Yeah. But uh, there was a boat on a trailer, and this guy arrived first, and uh, he had no tow bear or probably a hired old car or something. But um, I was determined to get it to the lake because I was going to get a couple of quid for it. Yeah. Two pounds or something. So I had a bicycle. <laughs> and the boat, the trailer, my father, met, my father and Tom Healy made the trailer, but they had it in a way that it was balanced. So it was easily, you could manoeuvre. So I t- it was a bit far over the road to walk with it. Uh, there was no jack wheel. So I tied it to the saddle of the bike and I walked over the road and my two brothers pushed it. But that oh, time you could do it because there wasn't much traffic. That was yeah. in, that was in, in uh, the 70s, in the mid-70s. Um, and I brought it over the lake and, and put it out. And I remember getting two pounds or 50 pence or something like that. I wouldn't bore it, yeah. Episode two, Alan Reese. Staked out this pool on the River Tyvee. Okay, it was uh, above... Landis Hill there, and uh, uh, and I knew they were fishing there because I'd been down and I looked, you know, I'd climbed a tree and seen these fish going around, and I I sat there oh maybe two hours before dusk, and I thought right I I'm going to be first on this pool, and as darkness started to come in, there was like sort of a a, a high bank opposite, and I was sat there waiting, high bank opposite with some trees, and I heard some branches starting to crackle and I was like someone's going to come down the bank there and 
and jump in the pool ahead of me. I, I'm not going to have that. And I waited and I waited and these crackles and branches started getting a bit more and more. And more. All of a sudden, there was a, a massive crack. And I it, I found out later, it was a, pen, a fence post had broken. There, there happened to be a cow scratching its back <laughs> against the fence. But when the fence pre- when the fence post broke, the cow came tumbling down through the trees. <laughs> right, yeah, down through the trees, off the bank, into the pool. And this cow was swimming in this pool going, moo, moo. <laughs> right. I wasn't happy, I tell you. Right? Uh, and I thought, I'll give you moo, you... What I mean, right? The nearest bricks I could pick up, I was throwing them at the cow. I've been here three hours, smack, moo. And every time I hit the cow with a stone, it it moved again. Episode 48, Recorded Record Ferox. All of this time, your stomach is in knots with the excitement and the adrenaline because you really don't want this fish to come off. And I did, as I said... Previously, I hooked a fish the year two years before, and it, it was a big, it was a record sized fish that and he came off. And he'd start to myself, I don't want to go through that again. If this fish was going to come off, I was going to just step over the side. So, anyway, I played this fish, and it looked like now it was just over the hour she was ready for the net. So, again, if you can imagine now, you're in the boat. The fish is behind you, you're facing the wind, and you're drifting away from the fish, which is quite difficult, But and then you're down in a trough and up. So I had my big net out, had it over the side, and she came to the surface on her side, and she would just come into the net, and as I, she came into the net, the trough, the way the wind was, blew the boat up into the, like the crest of the wave. And the fish slipped out and back in. You can imagine what I felt. The fish was half in the net and she just slid back in. And at this point I'm thinking, oh, I was so lucky because I could see the bait and the hooks was inside the mouth. If it had been outside on the jaws, as she slid out at the edge of the net, a good chance the hooks would have been stuck in the net and then inevitable would happen. She would have come off. Another 10 minutes passed now. And if you can imagine, I know the size of the fish now. I've seen the size of the fish. And I still haven't got it in. So, like I said, about another 10 minutes passed now. And she came up to the surface again. And I slipped my net under this time, clean as a whistle, lifted the net. And that was it. But I didn't just lift her in straight away. I was so shattered, mentally as well as physically hour and a quarter that fish would be on so I held the net at the end of the gunnels for like two minutes it seemed like a lifetime just looked over the side see the fish there lift it then one heave into the boat and I could see then that this was the record episode 18 Colin Fallen I was on Gilly and Always the first seven days in July was, was, you know, year on, year off. That was always with Don. And sometimes he'd have a guest with him for the week. And this time he had a guest, a fellow from Belgium, an lad from Belgium. So anyway, well, three days into the fishing, we were fishing uh, beat one and Ban Hinch, and we were fishing on the far bank. And on the near bank, there's all rushes and reeds. And he hooked a, a fish about five or six pounds. And the fish kept you know, trying to run into the, the, the rushes on him, you know. And I kept saying to my sister, I said, don't, don't let him in there. I said, don't let pull him out, but pull him out. And he wasn't stopping the fish at all. And uh, Was it a trap? The fish went, no, it was a, a grill, salmon. Yeah. The, the fish went straight into the reeds anyway. I said, you fucking idiot. I said, I told you not to let him into the, <laughs> the reeds. And sure, the, the fly, the, we lost the fly as well, which kind of really annoyed me because I only had the one of it and it was working very well that week. So I had to break, I had to snap the line anyway and, and got it back. So I finished up with them on the, the Friday and I knew they were going to to dinner in Romstone, into O'Dowd's restaurant in, in Romstone. You were actually in there with me one yeah, time. Yeah, I you? remember, yeah. Chowder. You had a liquid so lunch anyway, as well, I think. 
don't you see how I stopped? We had chowder around. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happened was uh, I, I drove back to Galway after doing seven days work with them and I was emptying out my car and lo and behold, Yamano's fishing bag was in the, ca- in the boot of my car, the Belgian fella. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, you want to see all the, the hardy reels he had and boxes of fully dressed salmon flies and this, that and the other. Like, this was this was 50 grand worth of stuff now in his, in his uh, bag, like a big bag. So I said to myself, I can't be responsible for uh, shipping this back to Belgium. Like, I, I, I hardly even knew his name and stuff. So you forgot I it. Jumped back in the, forgot it. Yeah, it was in my car. I jumped back in the car anyway, and I drove back out to uh, Roundstone, which is about an hour and a half from, from Galway. And I went into the restaurant and... I brought in the bag and there he was with Don and there was two other fellas, two kind of big heavies. And I, I said to myself, right, this makes sense now because I'd seen them two big fellas, you know, daily for the last week and stuff like that. You know what I mean? They were his bodyguards, right? right. So Don says, and says to me, uh, you'll stay for dinner and you can stay in my house. That's a brilliant uh, gesture what you're after doing there. And I said, well, thank you very much. I, I'll enjoy that. And he says, no, he says, Colin, I, I'll formally introduce you to the King of Belgium. He says, right, Albert, the King of Belgium. And I went, oh, hello. Uh, uh, how, do I, how do I refer to you, I says to him, you know? And he says, well, most people will call me uh, your majesty. He says, but I loved it when you called me a feckin' Egypt. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not used to being called a feckin' Egypt, he says. Right, so I says, I just called the King of Belgium a feckin' Egypt. So that was, that was good. Yeah. And probably my favourite last cast story, John Graham. Well, there's one question I ask now. Every podcast I do, there's one question I ask everyone. Go on, boy. Where would you want to be to make your last cast? Oh, that's a hard question to answer, that is. That's a hard question to answer. To make my last cast. I can think of a thousand places. I can think of a thousand places I've been. Any pools? Yes, but then a lot of them are no longer there. The river has changed out of recognition. I got such memories. There's nothing like sea trout to give you lasting memories. Yeah. It does, it gives you lasting memories, you know. The night, a, a night with cloud and the moon sailing through the cloud like it's like a galleon, a gypsy night I call it, and strong wind blowing upstream. Them nights the big sea trout used to be on the run and you'd be fishing and, and casting against the elements, whacking it into the wind, you know what I mean? And when they used to take it, they used to take it with vengeance. You, that's the sort of dynamic fishing I remember. Fantastic. So where would you like to go fish? I can't, I can't answer that. <laughs> because there's so many. I've been to so many piece, pieces of beautiful water. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to listen to more, please consider becoming a patron. We will get weekly podcasts and access to over 140 episodes behind-the-scenes photography to go with each episode, plus other exclusive content and prizes. To become a Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash castingwithkerryjones, or you can find the link on my website, castingwithkerryjones.com. That's all for now, and tight lines, and don't strike too soon. You've got to go armed. You can't go fishing for sea trout with your finger up your ass. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, he's getting it started now. Behave. <laughs> You've got to go armed, Kerry. You've got to go yeah. armed, boy, for any given situation.